Okay, today on my channel, I have Elisa from Follow the Intuition, who's been kind enough to take time out of her busy schedule to talk to me. So Elisa, if some of you don't know, is my prior uh, coach throughout my recovery for some of my recovery. Um, I used her, I shouldn't say used her, she helped me um, throughout my recovery tremendously. Such an awesome coach. So Elisa, thank you so much for being on the channel today. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people who follow me follow you, but just in case there are some out there that don't, will you just, just very briefly kind of talk about your history with an eating disorder? Yeah, so uh, I came from uh, bulimia, orthorexia, also uh, overexercising and extreme dieting, and, um, and I recovered in 2014. So, so yeah, I don't know, like, is there anything else specific you want me to touch on my recovery or yeah, otherwise no, just kind of what you go into like the yeah. whole history? <laughs> totally, I know. And always like, whenever I get asked that question, like, I wish that I had it just recorded and I could just push play because it, for me to have to like say it so much, I get so bored with it. So I, that's why I said, like, I'm not going to ask you to like go into detail of everything. And if yeah. people want to know more, watch your channel because you talk a lot yeah. about your own experience mm -hmm. with your eating disorder. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Um, but you are fully recovered and yes, you did have an eating mm -hmm. disorder. So you have a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. Um, first question though, that I want to ask you is what do you think the three most, or can be more or less most common pitfalls that you see with your clients in your coaching that really just kind of derail them or keep them really from fully recovering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, recently I actually did like a whole video about this. I don't know if you oh, have seen you the video, but it's like I talked about, I don't know, was it like eight common like recovery traps or something? So uh -huh. yeah, it's like okay. a, the whole topic is like quite fresh for me, but you can watch that video and, uh, but I can say like a few things maybe, or the first thing is that the um, like recovery is scary, right? Like we... Like we know we don't want to get like too overwhelmed and and of course like doing the little challenges here and there like of course like this is better than nothing and um and you are being very brave <laughs> but at the same time like what i see is that people often you know tiptoe through recovery and they mm -hmm. do like a challenge like a day and they are like okay now i can you know <laughs> Like that, mm -hmm. not like go back to restriction, but I can now like eat my safe, safe meal or something. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. like, uh, like starting off like with like a few challenges each day or each week or something, like, of course it's better than nothing. But it's like, if it continues like this, where you are trying to like rewire those good positive behaviors and the full recovery behaviors, but then at the same time, there are like, I don't know, 10, 20, 50 other behaviors that are eating water throughout the day it's just gonna like like I don't want to say like unwire all of that effort mm -hmm. but it's like it has to be consistent like you have to almost uh, like ask yourself like what is the message I'm giving to my brain and my body every day right mm -hmm. like a few challenges here and there it's just not gonna cut it like tiptoeing through recovery is not gonna cut it like like ultimately I feel like it has to be the like all in approach right yeah totally. and and I totally like I hate otherwise I really hate like the black and white kind of approach and you either like fail or not but it's like in recovery in a most kind of like kind way it it is kind of black and white because if I would be here still doing my disordered behaviors I wouldn't be fully recovered so in recovery it has to be like quite black and white are you doing mm -hmm. a fully recovered behavior or are you doing an eating disorder behavior? Like, right. totally. and, um, and uh, it's okay to take your time and start off and everything, but it's just like, at the end of the day, like you have to go fully in and, and you have to do, of course, the food challenges, you have to eat enough, you have to eat consistently, you have to do the brain rewiring work and everything. So so yeah, it's just yeah, like that's wonderful. I love that. I think that's so like a few points that you made that I want to touch on. One, like you can you can eat like a cheeseburger 
you know, one day and then the next day you have a big piece of cake. And then the next day and you're doing this like one challenge a day thing, or even slower one challenge a week type of thing. And it's like, how is that same thing? How's that sending the message to your brain that you, you don't need to be afraid of food or weight gain anymore. Of course it's not. It's becoming this like game of whack-a-mole where it's like, and all clients are like, yeah, I ate such and such. And I'm like, and what was the rest of your day? Like, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. well, what did you eat before and after that challenge? Everything that you're eating each time you eat should be a challenge. And with the black and white thinking, you kind of, you're doing it or you're not. And I think where people get tripped up with, tripped up with the black and white thinking is they think that that means perfection. So like, yeah. if, yeah. if, if you're not perfect, then you're nothing, you can never mm-hmm. recover. That's very much black and white thinking in that way, mm-hmm. black and white thinking in terms of like, okay, I know that like, if I choose a safe food right now, that's, it's pretty black and white. That's not helping me rewire. That's not helping yeah. me it's not to, to work through or get further. Right. Totally. That's not pro recovery. Um, and so that way of thinking, I think is different from like perfection or expecting mm-hmm. no no slip ups. What you do with that though, is what's important. You recognize, Oh my gosh, like that was not for recovery. I have to change that. Um, and instead of just being like, well, today is lost. I screwed it up today because I did whatever at my snack or I missed my snack. So just the rest of the day, I'm just going to just play it safe. That's not how you're going to recover. So I think that like resilience or that like recovery time that you take after you recognize that you messed up is so important. So, so important. So yeah, I love that. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so what else in this video? I know that if anyone wants to know more, they should definitely go watch mm-hmm. this video, but anything else off the top of your head that you want to talk about? Yeah. Uh, something that wasn't in my video, but something else I was thinking is that the unrealistic expectations in recovery, right? Mm-hmm. Like when we, uh, like, just like before, like this call, I had one other call, like with my client and, and, um, and uh, like she was, uh, I think like two months into her recovery or three months or something like that. And and just kind of like, you know, thinking like, oh, the extreme hunger should be over by now and why I'm still gaining weight and why is this is still happen or, or people think like, yeah, why I'm still bloated, why I still have this and that symptom and everything. And it's just like, like they have an expectation that at some point, like these symptoms should stop. <laughs> and they have this kind of mm-hmm. like an arbitrary deadline to the recovery or the symptoms Mm -hmm. and everything and I understand like in some way it can be almost like a comforting thing like oh it's temporary it's gonna pass and everything but when you get to the you know the arbitrary date and the symptoms are still there or not as progressed as you are expecting it's just gonna set you up for feeling disappointed so I always feel like you have to have the mindset of uh, like I'm gonna do whatever it takes as long as it takes and also focusing on the not thinking about like when will this extreme hunger stop or well when I when my weight will stabilize or when the bloating will uh, you know stop or something because those are all the things that are not in our con- in our control. So obviously, right. if you focus on something that is not in your control, it's gonna freak you out. So rather mm-hmm. focus on things that are in your control. Don't worry about the future or when these things will pass or what the date or whatever, but worry about right. like, what am I doing today right in this moment? Is it pro recovery or is like not recovery? Because this is totally. ultimately what you have control over. So don't worry about when the extreme hunger will stop, rather start focusing on, am I doing everything on, on my part to the extreme hunger to be possible to stop one day? Like, like what am I doing today? Does it signal like safety around food to my you know, right. body and my brain? Does it signal like unconditional permission? Does it signal food abundance? Or does it still signal deprivation? I shouldn't eat this much. This is bad. I'm being bad. This is unhealthy. This is not working. That is just going to cause like so much stress for your body. So it's like, like you have to switch the focus on like the your expectations or shoots or what should happen in, instead to the like the present moment what am I doing today to you know recover and make those symptoms pass it's right. like because yeah, that. your body does it we don't have control over when or how or the weight how much whatever but it's like you right. only have control over like your mindset and what you focus on each moment mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's so true because I'll, 
I'll see clients that, um, you know, as soon as things get uncomfortable physically, like obviously mentally going into it is a challenge from the very beginning, but as soon as it starts to feel a little bit uncomfortable physically or a lot uncomfortable physically, it's like, I can't do this. This isn't for me. This isn't, this can't be right. There's something wrong. And it's like, well, think about like when you're learning, learning like a new skill, like piano, which is funny. I use that example because I don't play piano, but I did try when I was a kid and I was horrible at it and I stopped because it was hard. I mean, fingers like I didn't feel like it did not feel right. It didn't feel comfortable. It was frustrating. And I think it's similar in recovery where it's like, of course, it's going to feel different. Your body's adjusting to getting more food. It's adjusting to resting. And so just because it's not this like glorious, um, you know, experience that you're feeling in your body and it just feels so nice and relaxing and you get eat all too. It, it doesn't, you're bloated and you're full and you're gassy and you're crampy and you're irritable and maybe you have a headache and maybe you, your mood's all over the place and you have no energy and you feel lethargic. Like all of those things are normal in recovery and people will hear that, but then still, once it happens to them, they're like, something's wrong. I'm doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. I think I need it. It's like, no, that's, that's pretty mm-hmm. much to be expected. Um, and I think when people start getting impatient is when they start comparing, they start seeing like mm-hmm. so-and-so on, I, I, I have mm-hmm. so many conversations about someone on, on social media or someone that is posting such and such. And I just I'm like, stay in your lane. Like, I don't want to waste our precious coaching time talking about so-and-so or who cares what they're doing recovered, not recovered. Um, you know, like mm-hmm. who cares what is happening to these people that we're looking at online, just focus on again, what you said, what are you doing in this moment to, to prove to your brain that food's abundant and to, to make the recovery choice? Like, what are you doing in that moment? So, yeah, I think that's really good advice. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Anything else <laughs> for pitfalls? Yeah, I can say maybe like one more um, is uh, I, I wrote down some notes for myself. Oh, uh, yeah, like very important thing to focus on is the, or how I call the recovery trap is the distraction from action <laughs> trap. <laughs> and uh-huh. what this means basically is that, you know, like, like it's like I was so helped by the information online and the books and the videos and the podcasts and everything. But it's like what I see is that people like, they have all the knowledge like they are like yeah i'm watching this and that and i've seen that video and i read that book and i watch that podcast and everything like every day i'm like reading and learning and everything but at the same time it's like a distraction from action <laughs> it's like are mm-hmm. you taking oh, action yeah. because at the end of the day like you can know everything about recovery but if you don't implement if you don't take action like none of it will you know lead you to full recovery so mm-hmm. yeah it's like totally normal to want to know everything and i was all about the, like oh i want to know and everything but it's like you have to take action like simultaneously like at the same time because also like taking action this is where like you learn the most like taking action and then having your struggles and then feeling stuck and then like figuring out like what to do and this is really like how you progress the most because if you have no like i don't know being stuck or like oh it didn't work this way it's like you never learn uh, anything and you can't progress to the next stage so I think like many people are you know like researching because they want to do it correctly and not make any mistakes but at the same time it's like only through like going through it and taking action you can even you know learn and progress otherwise it's like there's no way to say like yeah like for you exactly those 10 things and it's like you are, mm-hmm. you know, recovered. It's like, no, you really like, there's always some trial and error and figuring out this path on your own, but you can't find it unless you start taking action. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, I just mentioned the other day in a video that someone asked, like sometimes I'll do lives and someone asked on the live, um, you know, I'm obsessed with like recovery content and, and is that okay? And it's like, if your action, like if, if this content is getting you into action and you are like totally committed to recovery and it's keeping you focused away from like all the distraction outside, like in in terms of like the outside world and diet culture and all that. And if this is keeping you focused, which for me, my recovery really did. But the difference is if you're actually eating while you're watching those videos and Mm -hmm. you're reading about a tool in the book or something, and you're immediately implementing it into your recovery it's it's and I was guilty of this before I really went into recovery was I literally read every book that was ever out there I could have you know like regurgitated everything I had ever read about recovery 
yet I was yet I was I still hadn't taken any action it was much easier to read than it was to actually eat a cheeseburger so I just kept doing that and so mm -hmm. it's important that yes if you're taking in all of this content and it's helping you and you're like progressing through recovery and you're making the changes you need to I think wonderful like there's a lot of free resources out there awesome but if you're that person listening and you're just watching video after video after video, just waiting for something to spark inside of you, mm -hmm. this aha moment of like, oh my gosh, Elisa said mm -hmm. it today. She said the thing I was waiting to hear for 15 <laughs> years. It's like, it's not going to yeah. happen. You're not, you don't have, that, have that much power. Neither do I. Like, it's going to have to be that person, you listening, that's going to make that change. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Very good. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Unless you have anything else to add, I'm going to ask your next question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Want to move on? Okay. So what are some of the attributes that you see in clients that do really well in recovery? So what makes somebody really successful in recovery that you've seen through your experience working with clients? Yeah. So I think like, I don't want to say that it's, it's kind of like a, like a personality traits or like something. Yeah. It's not like, oh, like they have, I don't know, access to more knowledge or like, maybe that could be also true. But for me, it's more about uh, like someone's commitment for the recovery mm -hmm. and committing to doing whatever it takes and kind of like showing up to their recovery. And this is why mm -hmm. I love working with Becky. <laughs> because <laughs> Becky, even though like, exactly, like you were struggling, like it wasn't easy. Uh -huh. and I mean, it's not like, oh, you had only positive days and every day you were like, oh yeah, motivated. But it's like, you were committed and you showed up. And I remember like, literally like you emailed me every day, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. about your progress, mm -hmm. about your fears, worries, where, what you're doing and everything. And also like, you were very honest about your, what your struggles are and everything. So we could figure it out. So like, I see like people who are committed to their recovery and even like through their bad days or negative moments or being stuck or having fears and everything. But it's like the commitment to keep on going and do whatever it takes to get to full recovery. Another thing is, I think, like the like taking responsibility. And you know, I have been through the like, like why me? And being a victim to the what she said and how they triggered me and how that culture is making it harder and everything. It's like, like there is no doubt about that. Like living in this like diet culture and body obsessed world, like of course it's right. making it harder. And of course, if I don't know, somebody in your family is triggering you or something like, of course, like it's very valid, it makes it harder. But it's like, like if they are doing something, um, it doesn't mean you have to continue doing it. If they are mm -hmm. saying something about somebody's body or your body, it doesn't mean that you have to believe it. So taking like, you know, responsibility over your thoughts about yourself, your beliefs about yourself, your body, your food, and taking responsibility over your actions, because the diet culture makes it hard, but uh, your action doesn't depend on the fact that all people need to recover first before I do, then I can be recovered. Mm -hmm. So taking mm -hmm. responsibility over your mindset, your actions, your thoughts, your beliefs, and everything, and realizing it's all up to you. So that mm -hmm. is like a very important thing. Uh, and uh, ah, another thing, what we already talked about taking action, because, you know, like as a coach, I can only do so much. I can... Mm -hmm. I can help I can have tools I can you know um I can yeah like train you to like think differently you know um tell you like what steps to do or or something but at the end of the day like I can't take action for you and it's totally fine that sometimes you know like it's really hard for example for a person to like eat on their own and the coaching might not be enough for that person. They literally mm -hmm. need somebody in a real world there by their side, like helping them eat. But it's like, then you have to take action and find that person or find a way to do it. But it's like, like I can't do that part, like a physical part for you, like stopping the behavior, right. eating, stopping the exercise, not going to the toilets and perching. It's like, yeah, like we can work on some tools and how to... Uh, you know 
be in those moments and shift your thoughts or cope with the uncomfortable feelings and everything but it's like yeah like the taking action it's like the the part that i can't do nobody can do it yeah mm -hmm. and also even when people yeah. let's say they go through like the treatments and everything when they are fed and everything is kind of like done for them which is very positive right because people need this push and help but what's going to take you to full recovery and keep on being recovered is that like what you're going to do right right yeah, yeah absolutely and it's, at some point in your recovery you're 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 gonna have to be the person that's making a change right it could be like you said you could kind of be launched into recovery from external forces maybe you're inpatient maybe you're doing a day program maybe you've got parents you're living with that are kind of force feeding you but at some point it's gonna have to be you that's making those changes intrinsically because you want it because you realize hey i have the power inside of me to be able to do this right now and i don't need anyone telling me it's okay i don't need anyone holding my hand i don't need anyone watching over me to ensure that i'm doing this i actually can do this and i think some of us get like into institutionalized um, that have been through a lot of treatment it took me a long time to realize and I, it was sort of an aha moment for me to be honest when i realized like holy crap i can do this like there is nothing mm -hmm. tying my hands up keeping me from eating there's there's i'm a i'm a grown woman i'm an adult like i can do this i can get myself out of this and when i had that vision of actually me carrying that out and being able to do that was when i think things actually started changing and shifting and when i got excited about it like i i don't need yeah. a dietitian i don't need a therapist mm -hmm. talking to me about my feelings to get myself to eat a cheeseburger like i can actually mm -hmm. do these things mm -hmm. um but as a coach i would say and we'll talk about this in a second one of the hardest things is you so badly want to just like be able to control that you want to be able to like shake that person and be like if you just trust yeah. me just listen to that you know it's like and yeah. you can't so sometimes you'll get clients that are really resistant and they're not making any changes and at some point um as a coach you have to make that decision like hey i'm not helping you and i don't want you to waste your money so we're gonna have to cut the ties here and that's hard mm -hmm. but at the same time it's like we don't want to enable them or allow someone mm -hmm. you know that's saying they're Recovery to their partner or yeah. spouse, and they're considering being with the coach in recovery. You're not in recovery, so you need to go find something else or wait until you're ready mm -hmm. or something. But that's hard as a coach, I think, to watch mm -hmm. that and so badly want it because I care about each one of my clients, and I know you do too. I can say that mm -hmm. personally, I know you do. Um, it's so hard to watch them struggle. It's similar mm -hmm. to when my child's struggling. Mm -hmm. I feel like I want to just be able to be like, if you could just see, like, as in a, why I'm doing this and teaching you this as a child now so that when you're mm -hmm. adult, you can be able to do X, Y, and Z or be responsible and independent. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's similar with a client, regardless of their age and not that they're a child, but it's like, if you could just see the future, if you could just see what this would be like, mm -hmm. if you can make these changes now, how you're, not, you're gonna look back and you're not gonna regret it. You're not gonna be upset or, or, yeah. or you know, remorseful that you don't still have your eating disorder. Nobody yeah. is that, that fully finds himself free from it. So mm -hmm. yeah, for sure um okay let's see where are we at here um what's the hardest thing about being a coach and i guess this is just kind of what i mentioned was just watching people struggle and wishing that you could mm -hmm. you know wishing that they could just trust the process and and do the hard work and and not question and overthink everything but for you what do you think is the hardest thing about being a coach mm. yeah i also think that like you almost want people to like know or experience what you have experienced and like trust like what you say and everything but at the same time like you are able to put yourself in their shoes and you know that you were in an exact same place and and it's really hard to kind of tell them that they will experience something if they haven't experienced this yet but what i normally then like tell them to do is like start to collect your own like recovery wins or start to collect your own recovery kind of like proof that it is working like like no matter like how little or how insignificant or i don't know like if you have been challenging pizza <laughs> and you feel like oh yeah it's getting a little bit easier or when you realize that oh like there was like a whole hour i wasn't thinking about food right so kind of mm -hmm. like like seeing like those little like positive things about recovery but um but yeah 
but I understand like sometimes the fear is stronger or it is stronger than any like rational thinking and it's like it just comes down to the like if they are able to face the fear while feeling the fear and not expecting that the, the feel, fear has to go away before I do that thing or maybe sometimes even having like the trust and faith and just you know like taking that leap almost mm -hmm. like jumping over the cliff <laughs> free falling mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but yeah, it's like some it people like, are really yeah some people are not able to take this leap but it's like some people do it and this is where like we can like progress further but it's like yeah sometimes it's like very frustrating when you feel like really like like you have so much hope for somebody and you can already see this path because like you have been through it and I have seen it like happen so many times but it's just like yeah like at the end of the day it comes down to the person and and their own like willingness to take action and get uncomfortable and face their fears and everything so yeah like that is like the hardest part for me as well when I I realize that I'm like kind of helpless in some situations mm -hmm. as a coach yeah it's yeah. like yeah, you can have all the knowledge question. but it's just like I don't know if they need somebody else to say it or maybe you know like how sometimes you are kind of like yeah I heard the same thing like 100 times but when I heard it from you or when I was finally in a right place in my life or so sick and tired it finally like made sense to me or something right right but it's, yeah, yeah. Like, that's the hardest part realizing that I can't maybe help everybody or yeah, not everything is in my control, right? As a coach. Yeah, 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 for sure. That's a lesson I still learn. Like, you know, obviously when you're into recovery, like the only thing you control are your actions that are going to get you recovered. But mm -hmm. you realize there's a lot of things outside of recovery that you can't control. And it's a lesson I learned in recovery that mm -hmm. I can't control everything. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's something that I still remind myself every day with mm -hmm. my kids. Like, trust me, I wish I could control them, but it's mm -hmm. not, it's not a healthy mm -hmm. relationship and I can't, I won't be able to ever. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it's, there's so many lessons I've done a video on this, all the lessons that you learn throughout recovery mm -hmm. that you carry with you throughout the rest of your life. Um, I guess I'll, I'll ask you that question just a second. That's going to come at the very end, but um, the next one would be what are your favorite or best things about being a coach and kind of I probably can guess what this is but go ahead and, <laughs> and and tell us what is what are the things that you enjoy or the thing you enjoy most about being a coach yeah so the best thing about being a coach is uh like when I see and feel that like I can truly like help somebody and somebody is like uh, like making progress and I see their you know like like how they are like happy and they are like so proud of them and i can be proud of them and everything because this like i want my work to be you know full of purpose and meaning like i don't want to just get my day to the end <laughs> right like each day mm -hmm. like i want to do something that i am passionate about something that gives me joy and purpose and i feel like this is like what my work is like it gives me so much joy and purpose and especially because like I had an eating disorder myself and I went through recovery. So like being a coach now, it almost like makes my uh, like eating disorder not futile or it's it's like I understand now like why I had to go through it. Mm -hmm. And it makes like mm -hmm. everything come down to like a full circle. And it's just mm -hmm. like, I don't know. It's like so amazing to see how like you are given something that is like so negative and then you're able to kind of like make it into something positive and and help like other people go through it and and it's just yeah like sometimes you know like when people tell me like yeah like thank you for saving my life and i'm like oh my god like this is like so weird i'm almost like mm -hmm. no like what are you talking about but at the same time mm -hmm. i'm like wow like it is really significant like what i'm able, able to do and everything and so yeah it gives me so much like purpose and meaning and um yeah like happiness <laughs> yeah totally that's so yeah. cool as you're talking i'm listening in the background can you hear the wheels on the bus the song on the no, on the there. okay so i can hear it just in the background i'm like oh no people can probably hear this video but it made me think as you're saying this like how gratifying and rewarding it is to see people have their lives like change for the better because of the coaching that you're doing 
I have Hazel, my little one and a half year old before when we started working together, I was completely infertile and had a period for 20 years, right? My period came back and we got surprised with this little baby who I wasn't so sure I was ready for, but Mm -hmm. so grateful that we have her. And like, I'm sure Mm -hmm. you've had many clients that have become pregnant Mm -hmm. and started families. And like, it just, it's such a, it's, I I have a couple of clients just in the last couple of months that have delivered babies and they send pictures and it's like, there is nothing that brings me like more joy, true joy, Mm -hmm. not looking in a mirror when you're sick and seeing yourself emaciated, like true joy. I talk about this a lot on my channel too. Like what's true joy. Um, that kind of stuff is just like on the hard days or frustrating days of coaching that make me so grateful. Or I don't think people realize like how much, and maybe I'm sure it does for you too, just little messages on Instagram or a note here or comment there, just like how we are helping because there's a lot of free resources and things that we give out Mm -hmm. and we don't, and I'm not saying that we need all this praise and stuff, but it it means so much when someone, yeah, reminders that what I'm doing and the time I'm spending on videos and and whatnot is worth it. It's helping reaching somebody. Yeah. And so I think people, I think maybe underestimate how much that means to coaches. Like we don't, mm-hmm. we have hearts and that does mean a lot. It means so much. So yeah, yeah. totally. That's great. Very cool. Yeah. yeah um, this means so much. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. great. Um, next, next question. And maybe we'll end on this. Um, Hazel ran off with my iPad that had my question. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to ask the one that I remember. Um, but I think a lot of times we, will just assume and I did this too if I'm being honest I was guilty before I recovered of thinking that like my life was gonna be perfect once I recovered Mm -hmm. thinking like Mm -hmm. everything was just gonna be perfect perfectly everything was just gonna flow perfectly um Mm -hmm. but what I found when I recovered was like I'm still an impatient mom I still like you know um probably have some personality flaws I still and very blunt and will say things I probably shouldn't have said and don't think through it. Like I still am me, um, mm-hmm. flaws and strengths together once I recovered. And so I think people, at least as I get down the road with clients further down the road and they're getting closer to full recovery, they're realizing that they're like, Oh, so maybe I still do have a depression. Oh, mm-hmm. maybe I do still fight with my husband. Oh, maybe I do. And it's like, they're expecting recovery to solve all of their problems mm-hmm. and it doesn't, but what it does do is and you can, you can add to this obviously, but like it, it just makes it so you can cope with life. It makes it so you can work through those problems or tr- challenges. Just recently, I posted something on Instagram about just a really crappy mom day. Like I was just in tears. Mm-hmm. I cry a lot. I cry a lot. I'm mm-hmm. realizing like maybe cause I'm getting older. I don't know, but I cry a lot. My kids are always like, what is wrong with you? But I do. And it feels good. I still recognize that. And I'm like grateful that I'm feeling, even though it's sadness, mm-hmm or it's frustration or it's mm-hmm. anger. I'm like, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, I still to this day, I'm very grateful that I feel things. Um, so mm-hmm. I guess my point, but I guess, so the coping skills that you learn in recovery are going to carry over with other problems that come up after recovery. So what are some healthy coping skills that you have developed since recovery that now I'm assuming, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe your life is perfect. Elite. It <laughs> seems like it may be. <laughs> so maybe you don't have any, maybe you don't have any struggles, but I'm guessing yeah. maybe you have one or two. I don't know. So how do you cope with that? Mm-hmm. I also cry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you don't cry a lot? I cry a lot. I cry. You do cry a lot. Yeah. 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 I feel like it's making up for lost time. Don't you kind of think sometimes <laughs> I wonder like, why do I cry so much? Seriously. And I'm wondering if it's just like 20 years of being numb. And then suddenly, and now I'm like experiencing things so intensely and like feeling, yeah. and it's just like, I just, I don't know. Like I don't hold it back either. I just let myself cry. So good. I'm glad to hear you cry yeah. too. <laughs> Yeah, and for me, like I've always cried. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I've, okay. I never lost uh, emotions like in my recovery or something. But I feel like the difference is now that um, like my cries are more meaningful and more kind of like I allow myself to cry and I don't judge myself for it. I don't criticize myself for it. And I, you know, even sometimes, like, let's say I have a busy day. I'm like, oh, like something is off, like something is worrying me or something. And I feel like I want to cry. I literally tell myself, like, in the evening, Elisa, you have to cry. <laughs> like, I yeah, don't know. This totally. is stupid, but it's almost like, like taking time for this, like, self-care and addressing my emotions and everything. And and sometimes, like, what I literally, I would do, um, uh, it's like, um, I I also have, like, a video about this, like, how to how to cope with emotions, I think. Um, but uh, I like 
I maybe lie down or close my eyes or whatever. And I like ask myself, like, like what was going on? Like what happened? And like, what was I feeling? Like I feel sad, I feel, uh, I don't know, shame. I feel alone, I feel guilt, like whatever it is. And then I ask myself, like, where do I feel it in my body, right? And I just focus on the feeling in my body. Oh, like it's this, I don't know, let's say like a, like a kind of like turning sensations in my stomach or kind of tightness in the neck or my shoulders. And I just observe it with a like a non-judgmental awareness. And I literally mm-hmm. tell myself like, like it's okay to feel this feeling. Like I am safe feeling this feeling or emotion right now. Mm-hmm like mm-hmm. I allow myself and I tell, tell myself like I welcome this feeling right right I love that unconditionally be here right now and I just like breathe into this feeling I let it be I don't the purpose of this is not to make the feeling go away but almost like be present with it almost like I don't know like if a child is crying you don't tell them like stop crying because they won't stop right but you say right. like yeah I'm here for you like I hug you like you know, like, uh, I'm, I love you, whatever. It's okay so, to feel this way. Yep. Yeah, it's okay to feel. So over time, they're like, they calm down and it passes by itself because they know it's mm-hmm. okay to feel. But what mm-hmm. we do with our feelings is that we suppress, we numb, we distract, we say it's not okay, I'm not okay, I'm bad, I'm wrong feeling this. So this is what makes the feeling like even worse. So this is like a one thing I do with my feelings besides like, okay, I, I allow myself to cry. If I feel like I cry through it, I cry through it, <laughs> right? And I tell mm-hmm. myself like, it's okay. And I take it rather, it's like, like a physical way to get my emotion out. It's like good for me. It's like, I need mm-hmm. to get it out physically or I need to talk to somebody. I talk to my mm-hmm. mom, my husband, my friends, or sometimes if there's nobody, I can journal. I just like brain dump like everything into my mm-hmm. journal be very petty like everything you are the most crazy fears you're having or thoughts or whatever like just write it out because after it it's like also like a physical way to get the thoughts out so they don't just spiral in your head mm-hmm. where they like literally there's like no end to it but you have to like let mm-hmm. it out some way and some things uh, what I do uh, more is that maybe I look at my writing and maybe I like even like I don't have to write anything but I see like oh yeah like that is like a quite extreme thought maybe it's not true Mm -hmm. (laughs) right Mm -hmm. or kind of like you know it's like gives you more um like objective perspective it's not like Mm -hmm. so like internal anymore it's kind of like oh yeah like like this is like so extreme catastrophized it's not true and and maybe also I kind of you know can write like what is more helpful and or what is like a reframe what is another way I can look at this and see it in a different way, right? right. For example, like, um, like I, like why me? Like why do I have to eat have the eating salt? Or like I, there's something wrong with me, and it's um, yeah, like just feeling like hatred towards yourself for the experience. But it's like I can reframe right. it that like like maybe there is like a deeper meaning or you know like a lesson. I can learn from this or maybe for the rest of my life this opens some new doors for me for discovering right. like more self-compassion or kindness or strength in myself or whatever so like it's the still still the same situation I still have an eating disorder let's say but it's like how I view it it makes it either like you know positive or negative so it's like right yeah like how I change how like how I view it makes all the difference so that's yeah. the thing, like working with the thoughts. So yeah, those that. are some basic things I, I do. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. I think as you're talking, I was thinking about like one of the biggest things that I learned um, in recovery that helps with all my other ways of coping with things was like humility. Like I was so humbled in recovery because I went from a place of feeling like I had to be so superior, so disciplined, so fit. So all these things. And when all of those things had to kind of go away, I found myself feeling stripped of like what I thought was my false identity. And I was really, really humbled. Um, and when I feel like, or, or, or when you allow for humility, I feel like you allow for all feelings where mm-hmm. superiority, it's like, you've got this idea in your head that you can't feel anything yeah. negative because you're mm-hmm. superior. And so once I was like, let all of that go. And I was like, I'm just like everyone else and everyone else can feel things. So why can't I? And it just kind of opened a door for me to feel more like 
of course I can cry. Of course I can be a mess some days. Of course mm-hmm. I can feel the press some days. Of course I can wear sweats and a bun up and not shower for three days. Of course I can do these mm-hmm. things because everyone else does those things. Like I, mm-hmm. I can be, I can just be like a normal average person. I know that word freaked me out before I recovered, but it's like the most comforting. Yeah. I love that word now. I love it. Yeah. And so I think being able to, to cope, like what you said with all of these different emotions and knowing that it's okay, it's mm-hmm. okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to like repel it or fight it off or numb yourself out. Mm-hmm. Just you should feel it. And it's mm-hmm. shocking. I still am shocked at how, when you let yourself actually feel the feelings you're having, mm-hmm. they pass, they pass, mm-hmm. you move on. Like it's, yeah. you can, you can get through it. And it does feel like you said, you sometimes will make yourself cry. I just kind of let it happen because I know it feels so much better after I do. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's awesome. I love that advice. It's really good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, just before we end though, I want you to kind of, cause I know that we, sorry, I've got a puppy here that's mm-hmm. yapping. Um, before we close though, I just want to have you talk just briefly about your coaching. Cause we do coaching just a little bit different. Um, mm-hmm. I think our approach to recovery is very same, same, but like our structure of coaching is very different. I'm more of like a schedule when you need. And, you know, sometimes at the beginning, we'll talk about like a plan of, you know, once, twice a week type of thing. Um, whereas for you, I know that you, I'll let you, I'll let you talk about the structure of your coaching. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, I also offer like one-off calls and everything. If, if somebody wants a need, like depending on like where you are in your recovery, but I really love them like to work on somebody's recovery more consistently. And um, so like right now I do like normally like uh, three months or 12 weeks. Um, and I also offer like monthly if you want to just take a month or something. But I personally really love to have a person and kind of like learn about them, like who they are, what you what they need. I take a lot of notes. I put like I have my whole like recovery map, like for every mm-hmm. every client I work with. And I write down like every week, like what we worked on and everything. So I really mm-hmm. want to like because it's like again like I I don't know like it gives me like so much joy and everything but also kind of like um I don't want to say it's like a sport but it's just like like I I, <laughs> I want like this to, challenge this is a good I, one <laughs> yeah it's like oh exactly it's, it's almost like a challenge or kind of like a, like I want to see the progress I don't want to mm-hmm. just like end the call and then kind of like not have any like like how they're doing or how things are going right. or how did they implement did it work maybe they need something else so I really love to be like you know with them throughout this journey as long as they want to basically but they can take right. yeah yeah like uh, like three or four weeks or 12 weeks or something like that we typically start with but uh, but also right. I'm like very kind of like I don't want this to be your recovery kind of like a deadline like oh three months I should be recovered it's like no like then we will decide you can continue on your own or with somebody else or or we will continue further together or something but I really love that weekly weekly staying on track with a person because I know like the eating disorder it's not just like like one hour it's every day like it's every day there and also like when we talk an hour um then the most important part is actually the what happens between those calls how they implement what we talk about how they take action how they what is keeping them stuck stuck what are the fears coming up and so like I want to be like there every step of the way to like um, help them to get through each of the stumbling blocks or pitfalls or staying stuck or whatever so like to keep them moving forward because I know like Simply saying to do something is not enough. It's like when they totally. start doing it, then all the shit hits the fan. <laughs> and they are like, <laughs> totally. it's like, oh, like I'm freaking out or the challenges or yeah. something. And also yeah. like with my coaching, I really love, like I work with, uh, of course, the physical is uh, kind of like the first thing, like the foundation. Like you can't even rewire your brain if you don't give your brain enough fuel. Right. right or if you are like still perching or like compensating or if you're not eating enough throughout the day or something so like the eating enough for the physical part is so important uh, but also like the mental right. part because at the end of the day like like we restrict because of the thoughts and beliefs and the fears and the bad body image and you know like this is why we restrict right, right? right. like like we can't change a behavior if we're not changing the 
the thoughts and beliefs that are fueling the behaviors so this is why mm -hmm. like i also love to i like it's so necessary i feel to talk about the mental aspect and the yeah like the thoughts and beliefs and and the body image and everything but with my coaching like mm -hmm. i do have my own kind of like steps or the recovery map like in my mm -hmm. mind like what we have to cover but since everybody is individual and and they set their pace like if they are, you know, like really struggling with, I don't know, challenging the food rules or something, I'm not going to say like, no, this is done. So we're going to take that. <laughs> Sorry, it's, like, it's the next week. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, okay, that's done. Uh, it's like, no, yeah. like, like if you struggle with the step or something, we're going to keep on working it. So how we go about it is very intuitive. But I like Becky knows, like I also love to write like homework and stuff to do mm -hmm. and kind of like to practice and some writing exercises and and goals mm -hmm. and challenges because I don't like uh, like just talking I I want like action and and also for me yeah. like do things I love like to help myself things have to be very clear what I had to do otherwise it's like it's like I needed like focus and kind of concrete stuff otherwise it's so easy to get sidetracked or kind of like yeah I don't totally. feel like but it's like if you commit to something and we commit it together, it's like very plain and simple. Did you do it or not? Right. <laughs> yeah. Totally. You have to be really specific with clients because if yeah. you're not, they'll hang up the phone and the eating disorder is going to just like completely like um, twist and turn and like change everything that you talked about in a session if it's not really clear. So if it's like just eat more, it's not going to happen. It's got to yeah. be like, how are you doing that though? Specifically, how are you actually going to do that? Because we talked about that last week and nothing changed. Right. So it needs to be really specific. Um, yeah, I think that's all awesome. Um, I think it's always interesting after, you know, the first session with someone, you know, like how often should we talk? And I'm like, seriously, probably I wouldn't go more than a couple of days at the beginning because you'll be shocked when you're actually doing this, how much comes up, like how many questions and concerns mm -hmm. and doubts and reassurance at the beginning that you're going to need. And so, yeah, I think that's great that you offer that flexibility and, and um, durations of time that you're working with someone. So anyways, yeah, that's so great, Elisa. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and to come on my channel. I really do appreciate it so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was so nice to talk to you. Yeah, you are, I know, my, I always love you are pretty much my only colleague. <laughs> you know, like I work I, for myself and I work right. from home. I don't have like a, you know, like a office or kind of like with other people and stuff. So it's sometimes like it's, I don't want to say it's lonely because I really enjoy like working on myself and being my own boss and everything. But sometimes like you really want to like speak to somebody about the experiences and, totally. and the, you know, like the similar, you know, the stuff about the clients or what you are struggling with and everything. So I feel like right. Becky is yeah. like a very good now, like a friend to me after the, totally. all the coaching and everything. So I'm very grateful yeah. for you and I love to chat with you anytime. <laughs> oh, thanks. I know I, I joked about this earlier, like last time we talked about, I really think we need to like um, start a coaching support group, even yeah. if it's just you and I at the beginning, <laughs> but also like, I think there's a mm -hmm. lot of things about coaching that you can't talk to your clients about and like your mm -hmm. husband's sick of listening to it right so it's like mm -hmm. you gotta have some other coaches that you can talk to so maybe we'll, we'll maybe we'll form a, a coaching support group or something like yeah. that yeah <laughs> anyways all right thanks so much lisa have a good night it's a night for you so have a good night yeah okay bye <laughs> bye